So my name is Amy Savajan, and I'm going to talk to you today about functional medicine and ketogenic nutrition. So I'm board certified in internal, integrative, and obesity medicine. I have a practice in Pasadena, and I'm a member of the Institute for Functional Medicine. So today I hope to tell you a little bit about functional medicine, why we need it, how it differs from conventional medicine, and then I'm going to go a little bit into the mechanisms with ketogenic nutrition and how it works in some disease processes. So what, what is functional medicine? Well, it's really a model. It's a systems-based approach to evaluate disease. What we try to do with the systems-based approach is really look at the underlying cause of disease. The causes for each of us are a result of lifestyle, environment, and genetic predisposition. So when we think about conventional medicine, we think about disease and diagnosis. But really, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Many of you have had, may have had the experience, or you know someone, that goes to the doctor and they know something's wrong, but they can't figure out what it is. And they go in, and their tests are all normal. Their exam is normal. They are told they're fine and go home. But over the next few years, things get worse and worse. Well, well, what is this? In functional medicine, what we try to do is we try to figure out what this is. We try to prevent those symptoms from becoming a disease. We also have another way to illustrate called the functional medicine tree. And when you look at the functional medicine tree, the, the branches and the leaves. This is the patient's story. This is how, in traditional medicine, we evaluate disease. But, but as you know, if you don't have a good, strong trunk and a good root system, you're not going to have a healthy tree. So in functional medicine, we try to look at genetics. We try to look at lifestyle, nutrition, exercise, environment, stressors. So what is functional medicine? Well, it's patient-centered. It's evidence-based. It looks for the root cause. It's concerned with disease prevention. It's a therapeutic relationship between the doctor and the patient. It's system-based. It looks at systems and not just the symptoms. It looks at the whole organism and not just the organ. It's about balance. So what we try to do is we try to understand what may be causing imbalance in patients and really remove those things and then provide things that can lead to balance. The areas of imbalance in functional medicine are examined by these seven areas. We look at communication. This includes things like hormones and neurotransmitters. We look at energy. This looks at things like mitochondria. It looks at ox-redox reactions. We look at biotransformation, how things are changed in our body, how we metabolize things. We examine assimilation. This is really how we bring the outside world in, through our gut, through our skin, through our lungs. We look at structural imbalances. This could be anything from subcellular membranes, like mitochondrial membranes, to bones and joints. We look at defense and repair. This really examines immune and inflammation. And we look at transport, things like lymphatics and blood. So functional medicine is a dynamic approach. It, it looks at the whole system, and it, it really wants to assess, prevent, and treat chronic disease. We know that 70 to 90% of US deaths are due to these non-genetic modifiable diseases. And what we want to do in functional medicine is treat these modifiable factors. So research has shown the current cost to our society for chronic diseases like coronary artery disease, diabetes, and obesity is about half a trillion dollars. Um, and this is only expected to increase over the next few years. And you guys have all seen these diabetes prevalence maps, which also are only increasing, um, unfortunately. I think an important question to ask ourselves is, why is this happening? I mean, is, is it too much sugar? Is it... Um, our healthcare system? Is it dietary guidelines? What, what is leading to this? I pulled these two articles um, because I think they help try to explain how we need to change. We know we need to find a way to change. Um, the article on the left is a Mayo Clinic editorial, 
and it talks about medical reversals, how we've changed over time. And what it really gets to is that we need to find a better way to research. We need to get beyond reductionistic analysis and look at the whole picture. The article on the right is from the New England Journal of Medicine, and it really kind of speaks to how we need to shift our focus, how we need to move from sick care to health care. It says, we must teach aspiring physicians about system science. Medical school curricula should emphasize homeostasis and health rather than just disease and diagnosis. So getting at the whole iceberg rather than just the tip. Embedding prevention and teaching organization and the practice of medicine can stem the unabated, economically unsustainable burden of disease. And this is one systems-based approach that New England Journal of Medicine had proposed several years ago. And again, it's just a way to try to find ways of interconnection and, and how we can approach disease. So when we talk about a systems-based approach, um, I think a nice way to illustrate it um, came from an integrative physician named Sid Baker. And he has two rules, and they're called the TAC rules. The first one is, if you're standing on a tack, it takes a lot of aspirin to make it feel better. <laughs> and if you're standing on two tacks, taking out one doesn't make you feel 50% better. <laughs> so what does this mean? Well, in the first case, we need to get to the root cause. We need to understand what's causing the problem and not just throw a pill at it. And in the second case, we need a multimodal approach. We need to get beyond that reductionistic analysis and look at all of the factors that may be causing problems. And this is really what functional medicine does. This is actually why the Cleveland Clinic is spending millions and millions of dollars to institute functional medicine into their framework. So I'm gonna show a quick video just to help better explain and illustrate what a systems-based approach is. In the 1950s, the Dayak people of Borneo, an island in Southeast Asia, were suffering from an outbreak of malaria, so they called the World Health Organization for help. The World Health Organization had a ready-made solution, which was to spray copious amounts of DDT around the island. With the application of DDT, the mosquitoes that carried the malaria were knocked down, and so was the malaria. There were some interesting side effects, though. The first was that the roofs of people's houses began to collapse on their heads. Turns out the DDT not only killed off the malaria-carrying mosquitoes, but it also killed a species of parasitic wasp that had controlled a population of thatch-eating caterpillars. Thatch being what the roofs of the Dayak people's homes were made from. Without the wasps, the caterpillars multiplied and flourished and began munching their way through the villagers' roofs. That was just the beginning. The DDT affected a lot of the island's other insects, which were eaten by the resident population of small lizards called geckos. The biological half-life of DDT is around 8 years, so animals like geckos do not metabolize it very fast. It stays in their system for a long time. Over time, the geckos began to accumulate pretty high levels of DDT, and while they tolerated the DDT fairly well, the island's resident cats, which dined on the geckos, did not. The cats ate the geckos, and the DDT contained in the geckos killed the cats. With the cats gone, the island's population of rats came out to play. We all know what happens when rats multiply and flourish. Pretty soon the Dayak people were back on the phone to the World Health Organization, only this time it wasn't malaria that was the problem. It was the plague and the destruction of their grain stores, both of which were caused by the overpopulation of rats. This time, though, the World Health Organization didn't have a ready-made solution and had to invent one. What did they do? They decided to parachute live cats into Borneo. Operation Cat Drop occurred courtesy of the Royal Air Force and eventually stabilized the situation.
So how do you guys think that applies to medicine? <laughs> so in medicine, we often use metaphorical DDT, and we get this huge jar of side effects. Um, and that's, that's really what we want to work towards. We want to look towards prevention so that we don't have these issues. Um, what do you guys think the best way to optimize tens of thousands of genes, improve protein networks, minimize inflammation, improve cell signal transduction factors, and change biology? How, how do you think we should do this? Absolutely, yeah. So food is information. It regulates all the systems in our body. It's beyond calories. It's, it's code. It's like a code that upgrades and downgrades your biologic software with every bite. Um, Dr. Ludwig, a professor and researcher at Harvard, um, has some great studies that really help to illustrate how a calorie is not just a calorie. In one of the studies, he took children and he had them drinking isocaloric milkshakes, so the same number of milkshakes. But in one set of milkshakes, there were more carbohydrates, and in the other set of milkshakes, there were less. The kids that had the milkshakes with fewer carbohydrates actually burned 300 calories more a day. In another study, he had kids, and he had one group on steel-cut oats for breakfast and another on a veggie omelet. And the kids eating the veggie omelets actually ate 18% less food in the day. So again, I think it just illustrates how food is so much more than just a calorie. It's really information. So what kind of nutrition can lower inflammation, improve metabolism, decrease seizures, decrease migraines, decrease the perception of pain, improve depression, and lower the risk of heart disease? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, since functional medicine is really about understanding its ketogenic nutrition, and since ketogenic nutrition is, is really um, kind of getting at this, and functional medicine is a way to kind of understand the mechanisms, I'm going to go through a few very broad strokes of mechanisms and how ketogenic nutrition can help these things. So how does it work in weight loss? Well, we know we have some appetite suppression. Um, it turns out we also change our gut hormones. We suppress our ghrelin and increase our CCK. So our CCK helps us to feel satisfied. Our ghrelin helps us, uh, actually makes us hungry. So as we suppress that, we feel less hungry. Um, also, because in ketogenic nutrition, you have lower blood glucose levels, you have lower insulin levels. So that means you're going to have less um, fat being made, and you can use your fat um, more easily for energy. So how does ketosis work in metabolic syndrome? First of all, what is metabolic syndrome? Um, metabolic syndrome, uh, initially termed syndrome X, was where you had three of five criteria, high triglycerides, low HDL, large waist, high blood pressure, and insulin resistance. Um, and we've already talked a little bit about how insulin affects the, the waist size through the lipogenesis. Um, but it turns out in metabolic syndrome, it's really driven by these high insulin levels. This seems to be kind of the core factor driving it. Um, and I think one of the more interesting mechanisms is how insulin affects blood pressure. So it turns out that insulin stimulates your sympathetic nervous system. That's this kind of fight or flight aspect. Um, when it stimulates your sympathetic nervous system, it causes vasoconstriction. That means your blood vessels tighten down. As you can imagine, the fluid inside is under more pressure. In the same time, this high insulin also acts on your kidneys, and it helps you to store more water and salt. Um, I'm sure you guys have all had the experience or known someone that when they begin a ketogenic plan, um, they urinate a lot, they may get dizzy, they may lose a lot of water weight initially, and that's because they don't have that insulin acting on the kidneys. So now let's put it together. Without the insulin, we have less pressure on the arteries and we have less fluid inside the arteries. So you can see it works in two ways for blood pressure. So how does ketosis work for diabetes? Well, insulin resistance is really the primary factor 
in type 2 diabetes. Um, we, don't, we don't necessarily understand all the biology, but it appears to be driven by inflammation and how the carbohydrates are disposed of secondarily, what we do with these extra carbohydrates. A person with a lot of insulin resistance tends to send these carbohydrates to the liver where they get turned to fat. Um, and when we keep the carbohydrates below a level they turn to fat, then we see the signs and symptoms of insulin resistance improving. Some studies have even shown that um, as ketone levels increase, you get a correlative improvement in um, your metabolic profile. So uh, Dr. Westman sitting in the back corner, and so he knows this uh, case, these case studies well. Um, but one of my favorite patients that I think really illustrates the power of ketogenic nutrition was a patient that came to me on a Friday afternoon, and he had a hemoglobin A1C of 18. For those of you that don't know what that means, it means his average blood glucose over three months was somewhere between four and 500, day in, day out. So it wasn't an acute issue. It was a Friday afternoon. I didn't want to start him on a ton of insulin and bottom him out over the weekend. So I put him on a ketogenic diet, and I kept in touch with him. And over the next few days, his blood glucose normalized. And over the next few weeks, it was in the hundreds. The next time we sent his A1C, without the use of injected insulin, his A1C went from 18 to 6. Yeah, so I think this really helps to illustrate the power we have with nutrition, especially with ketogenic nutrition. So to go a little bit deeper into uh, insulin resistance, I mentioned briefly that insulin resistance is related to inflammation. Um, Insulin actually causes the, re the release of free radicals, or reactive oxygen species. Um, and these free radicals often target polyunsaturated fats that make up the cell membrane. Um, these polyunsaturated fats are really important in determining how our cell functions. So, you know, when we're looking for the insulin, when our cells are looking for the insulin, we send up receptors. And if our cell isn't functioning well, if our cell membrane isn't, we can't receive that. So as we decrease this inflammation, we can actually improve some of this insulin resistance and, and also improve the inflammation. In studies of low fat versus low carb, we actually see markers of inflammation, such as C-reactive protein, falling in those on low carb diets. So how else does ketosis work for inflammation? It also helps to um, stop the activation of NF-kappa B. What is NF-kappa B? NF-kappa B is a transcription factor, and it leads to all of these inflammatory mediators down below. Um, so if we can stop the activation of NF-kappa B, we can bypass a lot of these inflammatory mediators. How else does it work for inflammation? Well, Ketosis also blocks the formation of an inflammasome. As you could imagine, an inflammasome is very inflammatory. So the NLRP3 inflammasome is part of our immune, innate, sorry, innate immune system. Um, and it's responsible for cytokines like IL-1 and IL-18 that drives inflammation in many chronic diseases. And it turns out beta-hydroxybutyrate actually blocks activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about epilepsy and ketogenic nutrition. Um, really, that's how ketogenic nutrition came to the forefront was with epilepsy. And I think some of the mechanisms are really important for helping to understand um, things like depression and pain and migraines. Um, in epilepsy, there's a lot of inflammation and, and free radicals, and we've already talked about how ketogenic nutrition um, breaks or lowers the inflammation. We see in the left hand uh, on the bottom, that circle that says decreased reactive oxygen species, we'll have less inflammation using ketogenic nutrition. Ketogenic nutrition also stabilizes neuron membranes. So in epilepsy, you have these hyper-excitable neurons that easily create seizures. 
In ketogenic nutrition, we activate these potassium channels and it stabilizes the neuron. We also help stabilize the neuron through increased GABA. Um, GABA is a, a system where we kind of calm the body down. Things that increase GABA are, are things like alcohol, things like benzodiazepines. So in seizures, if someone's having an active seizure, we actually use benzodiazepines to stop the seizure. So how do we get this increased GABA? We actually get it because we create more energy with ketogenic nutrition. We actually, through PPAR-alpha, get more mitochondria. We get more ATP, and that allows for us to create more of what the cell needs. So really, in summary, with ketosis, we get improved energy through the beta-hydroxybutyrate, but also through the increased mi mitochondria. We get suppression of mTOR. mTOR is the mammalian target of rapamycin. It's really a, a pathway that helps to integrate energy. And what we see is people that have epilepsy, when they have higher levels of mTOR, they have more seizures. We talked about how ketogenic nutrition decreases the excitability of neurons through GABA and through these potassium channels. And then it decreases inflammation and oxidative damage. So using that model, how does ketosis work in depression? Well, in depression, we have kind of this global low energy. Um, and as you saw from the epilepsy model, ketosis actually helps with energy. We get increased mitochondria, we get increased ATP, and we also have the ketone bodies, which give us you know, direct energy into the cells. Um, interestingly, ketosis also causes a decrease in intracellular um, sodium concentrations, which happens to be a common property of all effective mood stabilizers. So how does it work in migraines? Ketosis in migraines works similar to an epilepsy. Um, Migraines are thought to be related to low energy, so neuron energy deficits, um, to inflammation, and to problems with blood glucose. So the ketone bodies, as you know, provide energy, but then we also get the energy from those increased mitochondria and increased ATP. In ketosis, we have less inflammation, and we also have a stabilization of our blood glucose. So how does it work in chronic pain? Again, in chronic pain, we think the, the pain is related to hyperexcitable neurons and increased inflammation. Again, in ketosis, we have these activated potassium channels, which help stabilize the neurons, and we have the increased GABA to help stabilize the neurons. We also lower inflammation because we have fewer reactive oxygen species. So I wanted to share a story with you. Um, this was a 40-year-old patient of mine, um, and she came in with chronic pain, inflammation, autoimmune, fatty liver. Her official diagnosis were rheumatoid arthritis, it was fibromyalgia, it was interstitial cystitis, it was IBS. Um, she had liver enzymes in the 300s and had gone through liver biopsies. Um, she was on IV Arincia, Neurontin, Cymbalta, Voltaren, and it wasn't controlling her pain. Um, she had a job. She liked her job, but she didn't feel like she had the energy to give to it. She had three kids, but really didn't feel like she had the energy to give to them either. So we started her on a ketogenic plan, um, and within a few weeks, she started to feel better. She started to come around. And within a few months, um, she told me that for the first time in eight years, she was able to live a regular day, to be with her kids, to be at her job, and really feel like she was there. And I think what this really speaks to, again, is the power we have with our nutrition, especially with our ketogenic nutrition. So, so in summary, what I hope to have shared today is how we need to move from a sick care model to a healthcare model, and functional medicine may provide that approach for us. Um, chronic illness isn't random, it's really the result of a lot of complex interactions between our genes and our environment. And ketogenic nutrition, from my experience, can be a positive factor in really addressing a lot of underlying issues that patients have. Thank you guys.